This interview is being conducted on August 18, 2005 at the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachie. I am speaking with Robert James Crandall. Mr. Crandall was born on June 8, 1924 in Battle Creek, Michigan, and now lives in Niles, Illinois. Mr. Crandall learned of the Veterans History Project when speaking to a librarian here at the library. He has kindly consented to be interviewed for the project. Here is his story. So you have a lovely, lovely written out thing that you have, but I'll ask you questions. Fine. And if you don't like anything, you know, you won't put them in the transcript. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you, do you want my uh, serial number and all that stuff? I remember it like yesterday. You remember it like, well, tell me it if you remember it like Six yesterday. 622 5228. How come you had to remember it? Just drilled into me. Did people ask? Well, they used to ask. It was in the arrangement that I was in in Nang. Uh, we used to have to go even on our peak. We went into various ports. We had a card, a pay card. And you had to give your uh, service number. And then they would process that. They didn't have computers, but I would mean, check. That way you'd get your monthly pay, whatever it was. So do they only pay you when you were in port then? Yeah. Well, yeah, there was a lot of times I'd be out. When I was out in the Pacific for several months, I didn't get any pay at all because well, there was no place to go. You yeah, know, there was nothing to spend your money on anyway. Which brought up an interesting point because the difference between, which I really honored the Merchant Marine, they were good people, but, and we worked together, although we were separate in the Navy unit, they were Merchant Marine. But in that period of time, I remember I came back, I forget how long we were there, but I got like, couple hundred dollars because I was gone for several wow. months and I got them all in singles because I wanted to have a big pick. and I remember <laughs> the radio man who turned out to be a good friend of mine was at my wedding when we came to Chicago but he was a civilian and they considered as an officer in Merchant Marine he collected eight thousand dollars oh my gosh just so like today then huh there was a big disparaging difference between merchant marine all the thing of it is that the navy went in to serve not necessarily during money but uh, just goes to show you the difference that's why we used to have all the papers <laughs> wherever you went if you needed any money you had to go and present that card to a specific location wherever you were at that, uh, so did you have things to spend money on when you were ashore? Did you find oh, stuff yeah, to spend your money on? You should have gone to a bar, and, you know, with the bullfights out in Peru, and, you know, go to movies, see plays in New York, do whatever, wherever we were in port, yeah, we wanted, wanted to do things. But when you were, when you were at sea, was there anything to... we gamble. Yeah. Shoot <laughs> dice and play cards. What nice wholesome activity. But, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't, didn't didn't lose a lot because I didn't have a lot to bet with. But I mean, we keep ourselves busy. Otherwise, in, in between your watches or when things were slow, you'd go crazy. You remember the film, Mr. Roberts? Mm. Quite, a, quite a show, you ought to yeah. see that about, that was during the war where the Navy uh, was like the armed guard, except that was the Navy cargo ship. We're going in such long hauls between the islands and stuff. You'd go nuts. You know, there was nothing else to do. Unless there was any action, I mean, you'd, you'd go crazy. So guys would play cards. We did the same thing. We used to play pinochle and bridge and cribbage and everything else you could think of. In fact, I used to spend hours up on the bridge with the Navy radio and when we were going to Africa and those places. and. Uh, Sure, we had the lookouts for watching things, and I'd be up on the bridge, which was my post, and we'd play, play cribbage, play chess, did a lot of things. Otherwise, you'd go nuts. Also, I found a, one ship I was on that they had another book on mathematics, so I helped learn my own mathematics and so forth, which I have since forgotten <coughs> since I got out of the name, or out of the telephone company. But a lot of it was helped me out even when I got in the telephone company. But I taught myself, fortunately, that time on that trip, we had a good lieutenant junior grade who was interested in uh, teaching, and he would help me through the mathematics and stuff. 
Wonderful. Well, do, so, you, do you remember his name? Yes, I do. Right. I, I always ask, because I think, you know, if you remember somebody's name, then they end up in the Library of Congress. How nice is that? He was Polish. I remember well, that. there you go. Close enough. You know, those the Polacks first, are everywhere. The first captain I had on the ship was Polish. Nice, he was a nice guy. But. Did you see, now you were from, um, you were from a Battle Creek, so you're from a pretty big place in Michigan. Did uh, you? I actually uh, lived in Battle Creek, and then uh, my, I was raised in Marshall, which is about 10 miles outside of, uh, with my grandma. But my mother and father were divorced, and then my mother got remarried. That's how I happened to end up going up to Montague, because <clears throat> my mother had been remarried, and uh, so I left Battle Creek to go go up there. So then you were, that's where you en enlisted, right? Right. I was a senior in high school at the time, and uh, I wasn't setting the world on fire either, I don't think, but my stepfather was the superintendent of the Montague Casting Company, which was a gray iron foundry up there at that time. It was rather small, but yet for foundries it was a pretty good size. It employed probably 150 to 200 people. But he was being transferred down to Tecumseh, Michigan, which is down near Adrian, to another bigger place. So that was during just about the beginning of the year, around December, January. Well, Montague was just a small burg of about 2,000 people across the lake, and White Lake was Whitehall. It's all resort area and stuff except for the foundry. They, uh, that town was about 3,200 at the time, but I didn't know a soul up there because I had just moved in there. My folks had only been up there about a year and a half, and I knew that if he was transferring, if I had to go down to the country and start school all over again, it was going to be a little difficult, And because uh, it was right during mid, mid year. So as I said in my notes, we were, went to Muskegon, which is about 20 miles away Every once in a while on Sundays, you know, we'd save up our money working in the foundry and stuff. And two of my friends and I, they had the car. We would drive down to Muskegon and go bowling. There wasn't any bowling alleys in Montague, nothing. Two gas stations and truck, about 15 saloons. <laughs> and you. And we. But we, uh, uh, well, we would turn on the car radio coming home. That was December 7th. And we heard that. We said, oh my God, can't believe it. However, the, the broadcaster was at that time was very, very specific. And of course, it was all over the radio at that time. Well, naturally, you know, we were all young and hot-blooded and all of that, so uh, really upset about the whole thing. And that was shortly after Germany uh, had just sunk the battleship Hood. And uh, there was a lot of hard feelings. There was, there was a lot of German people there, too. And, and, both sides. And mm -hmm. Nobody was really fighting, but there was just a lot of emotion. And so so and I knew I was going to be transferred, and I had no money to stay with. And I thought, I don't want to leave at this point in time, because frankly, I, I was about a C student, which I could have been A, but I mean, I wasn't. So in the meantime, I, I thought, I, I, I'm going to sign up. Well, of course, my mother had a fit, you know, no way you're going to do it, because I was 17. Yeah. But I don't know why, uh, things were just not too good in the family for me, right? But the superintendent of the school and the principal, two men, very nice, very nice people. And I was very active up there in social activities. Or you were too busy to be studying. Yeah, was. I was on plays and all that. Well, you had to make up your own, so I did all those things. And uh, Mr. Early was the superintendent nice guy, and uh, his daughter was a friend of mine, we were girl, boyfriend, girlfriend, but uh, he realized my situation and uh, some of them were not too favorable to my lifestyle, what was going on there in the family. So they waited about a, three, four weeks or so forth, yeah, and everybody was, <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, uh, they realized that I was having some difficulty. So they said to me that if you'll take some examinations, we'll give you your diploma ahead of time. Well, fine. So I don't remember taking the test, but I guess I did because 
They said, well, if your mother was saying you can go, well, as it happened, unfortunately, uh, as I said, I don't want to say too much about my stepfather. He would come to talk at that time. And so my mother said, well, yes, you can go, because I talked her into it. I said, you know, what the heck, I can't. This is going to disrupt my whole life, you know. Where am I going to go? But uh, of course, I had a little, my sister who was 11 years younger than me, and my brother was my half-brother. Yes. There was no problem there, but there was a problem with me. So that was the place to go. So I did. I signed up. Now, in the, in the records, they got me down for sometime in March. I forget the exact dates on my discharge papers. But actually, I had signed up sometime in February. Hmm. I went to Muskegon, took the examinations and all that, and interviewed. And then they put us, uh, several of us, on a bus from Muskegon down to Detroit, which is kitty corner all the way across the state. And when we got to Detroit is where we uh, took the oath and uh, signed up. But somehow or other, that never got translated until I went to Great Lakes, which was three, four weeks later. That was important because it has to do with the length of time that I was actually in the service. Because actually, I wanted to get that for that stripe, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, but anyway, when we got to Detroit, they put us up in a like, Class B hotel there. There was about 25 or 30 of us yeah, finally gathering together from all over the state. And they had a little honky-tonk type of restaurant and so forth that we could go to. They'd give us a little chit, they called it, a little slip. That way you'd go. We were half starved to death because they didn't, they didn't really go overboard in trying to feed us. And we had absolutely no money, no nothing. I had this, the shirt that I had on all that time. We did have a, you know, uh, uh, there was two to a room, we did have a bathroom, so I'd have to wash out my clothes. Oh my goodness. Myself and try to hang them, <laughs> hang them up. It was, it was rough. But fortunately, the people in the community, because the uh, people had all turned out in the patriotism to help us, help us guys. And they brought a lot of food. The USO was just starting to really get involved. And uh, they give us tickets to movies and stuff to occupy ourselves. But we kept thinking, God, we're starved. Where do we get the Great Lakes? We heard that that's just like Taj Mahal. That, <laughs> that, that's the place to be. Boy, what a, what a false illusion that was. <laughs> so we get to Great Lakes, and it was in, about in March. And there was mud and rain, and they were building the barracks at that time. And. Uh, Oh God, there was nothing but bulldozers and stevedores and everything else running all over the place. And the mud was fierce because, you know, we had to keep spotless, but how can you keep spotless? So half the place didn't even have sidewalks and we had to walk through that mud. And, uh, but that was an interesting thing is when we got there, as I pointed out in my notes. And when we first arrived, we got there in the morning. They shipped us by train from Detroit to Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember all the transfers that took place. That's a long time ago. Yeah. But when we got to Great Lakes, the first thing they did was take us in the big gymnasium and they had squares marked out with the, the sticky tape, you know, like three, but, but, but three feet, I mean, uh, 36 by so little squares for everybody. They said, go pick one of those, take a number, and they give us a box. I said, now you got to strip down everything. Shoes, socks, you know, I mean, everything was in the box. And they give you a pencil, and on the box, you got to write your address where you want that stuff sent to. So we're all standing around, I guess. <laughs> so we had to, we all stripped down. There was probably at least 75 or 80 of us wow. in that group by this time. So then the stuff went into the box, and I addressed it to my grandma and grandfather was back in Battle Creek because I knew that they, they, they would get it. Not that there was anything in there worth saving. <laughs> Not your shirt that you'd been wearing for quite some time. It for about a month. And that was hard. That was really hard because we had absolutely no money and no money whatsoever. Hadn't been from the good people and, 
uh, supporting what was then the beginning of the USO in that area. We just, we had nothing. But even then, here we are, start making, and then they run you through all these tests. Naked? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. By this time, it's about noon. So they gave us a box lunch. <laughs> so we're all standing around eating <laughs> box lunch. And, you know, naked as jaybirds, and they're thinking, oh my God, uh, this is this is Navy, uh, this is it. <laughs> so after we ate the box lunch, of course, you know, they're giving you a test, and then they decided we had to have a blood test. Now, I had never, outside of me, been uh, maybe for measles or something, but I've never seen anything like that. So they lined us all up in the hall. They had a big curtain across the hall. And when they got just about to my place, they pulled the curtain back, and here was the corpsman standing there, you know. He had the biggest, bluntest deal for drawing blood, and he was blood all over. I thought, oh my <laughs> God. I thought, here I, I got my first purple heart right there. That was it. And I thought, my God, guys were fainting like, you know, just dropping down. I finally hung on, but I was pretty green. But even after we got through with all of that, we had to go take a shower. And in the shower, it was so hot. The floor, the floor of that shower was right over where they must have had the furnaces or something. Oh, my God, you can hardly stand it, you know. So after we got through with the shower, then they took us into it. Uh, the, for the clothing allotment and stuff. And we just lined it up and we had GIs there and Corman that uh, they'd take a look at you and say, well, he's about a size so and so. And they piled us up. We had a mattress, a hammock, paper, pants, fresh shirts. We were pleased to get the pants at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they finally let us get the underwear on. <laughs> That's good. And then all of this. Now here we are, you can hardly walk out of there with all this. Plus a sea bag, you know, canvas bag, you put all that in there. And then they took us all in the room and showed us how you had to roll all, all that up. Now the Navy had a special way of rolling up your clothes. You know, everything that you had, and they give you a little, little uh, 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 ropes of things, and not ropes, uh, I don't know, cords. <coughs> little cords. Mm -hmm. And you had to tie it a certain way. Had to have it in a certain place. They measured it. Had to be in the square knot. Had to be so forth. But it had to be like that for inspections. And we were very fastidious about all that. So we got it all. It would all fit except for the hammock and stuff. But that became we'd wrap all that stuff up, you know, in the mattress and thing. Took us over to another barracks by this time, and they got steel stanchions like bays. They were big steel girders around, uh, tubes that were around. And you were assigned your bay, and they had to put your hammock up. And, of course, you, you know, you lived out of your sea bag. You know, there was no such thing as, as uh, uh, having dressers or, or, or even lockers or anything. You had to hand, and then they, you had to get the mattress in there. Then, and so we slept in hammocks. But you had to tie that hammock up in a certain way. You had to get a bow tied, just as tight as could be. And it was hard, because the ropes they gave us were all new, and they hadn't stretched out yet. Well, we finally got the mattress in there, and we got in there. And that wasn't too bad, because we'd had a hammock at home. and I'd, But here it had to be bowed, it was like a rubber band. I mean, those guys were flipping out of that thing. That next, and a couple of guys fell, broke their arms, another guy got broken away. Did you have to go above one another or was everybody no, on No, everything them? was all on one level. Well, that's fortunate. comforting oh, at least. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was something else. Well, I got in there, of course I'm dead tired, so I, I did sleep that night, but they used to get us up about four in the morning. And then when you had to tie that up every morning, that was the first thing. They wanted it all tied a certain way. There had to be half inches on that rope. There was had to be, I think there was seven of them. But mine was always that short, because they hadn't stretched out enough. And you couldn't pass, you couldn't go to breakfast until oh. you had that thing tied in the right way. Oh, you'd stretch and stretch and stretch. In fact, every once in a while we'd get over to help each other out to pull on the rope to straighten it out and get it tied up. And then of course you had a little ditty bag. That was for your 
razor, and of course I was in the chain with them, thank God, and I didn't have to worry about that, that. But their toothpaste and all that soap and everything. And then the, in the washroom, big steel, and it was like a big assembly line. And uh, it was all right, it was, it was okay. But you had to go in there and take care of all of that. And then, like I said in my letter, the first breakfast I went to, and the Navy was big at that time on mixing everything all together. This stuff was, I think it was salmon and mashed potatoes with ketchup and so forth. It was just all, all gummed up, you know, and beans. And when the corpsman, when you come by with your tray, you slapped it on there, bounced right off the tray, and, and he used to have, I had my pico tied around me. Oh, no. Got on it. And right away they said, hey, keep yourself clean. I, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I didn't, oh, it was a mess, so I finally had to clean that up. And, uh, but anyway, we were so starved. I do say that they, they fed us pretty good in Great Lakes. But... You mixed together. Yeah, right. Well, but, but it was, it was, it was healthy. We, of course, we'd eaten anything. We were so hungry. But then the routine started. Drilling, learning, practicing, and so forth. And, uh, we get up every morning, early in the morning, and then the thing is that they, they have wooden floors in these barracks. They used to make us get out of a steel wall constantly and keep that floor underneath your barrier area, just absolutely snow white with steel wool. Oh just goodness. put it on your feet and scrape it, you know, and keep it. Oh, I got so tired of that, and you get the steel wall all through you. Know. The worst part about it was the mud. And because they wouldn't let us come into the bar, even into the uh, in, into the utility room, you know, to clean your, couldn't even clean your mud off your feet. You had to clean it off outside before they let you in. You know, your water out there was in the puddles for all the digging and taking place. You had to break the ice off the puddles, to wash it all. I wonder if we didn't die of pneumonia or something. But you, once you get the bulk of it off, then they let you come in and. and the other funny thing was then we had to get shots, and uh, some more shots after we had the blood drawn. And of course, guys being guys, the people would come out of there, they, that those that were in ahead of us, they'd come out there with bones and drawn and say, oh my God, and you know, that's you know, it's brutal, you know. And uh, they say, and we won't even tell you where they gave the worst one, and I thought, oh my God. So, and fellows were fainting, they were standing there, and they, they were just storming, they were just cracking, and throw the, throw the needle at you, and plunk, and the needle broke off, they had to break taken out. So, finally, that wasn't too bad, but when we come out, we did the same thing for the next group, and they oh, oh my God, it's terrible, you know? <laughs> so, it was really funny, but it was a good bunch. We, we enjoyed it, and we got to be pretty good in drilling, thing was interesting is that, of course, I was the smallest guy. I only weighed about 120 pounds, 17 years old, about five foot eight at most. But I was pretty good at drilling, so some of us that were good, they picked us out. Remember, well, you wouldn't remember this, but in the, in the theaters, they used to have movie tones, which was like your news broadcasts and so forth. And so they would always have, I mean, things were going on in the service would show the Great Lakes, us sailors marching, with, and I was, I was, I got two seconds of fame because I was the last guy on the, on the end there, carrying one of the flags. And uh, so, but uh, that was interesting. And of course, it was funny too, because a lot of the officers came in, they were reservists, 90 day wonders, as they call them. They all met well, we were all, but our, uh, we were doing, we used to have to line up all the time when we were using rifles and bayonets. I remember one time when Smarell came through there, an officer, you guys are not lining up right and so forth. And so, so he kept running up and down the aisles as we were standing there, you know, he had, had attention. Anybody was out of line or so forth, he'd bump them and he'd knock them down. You know? So the next time he came through, the guys all got together. We all stuck the guns out with the bayonets. We got cut up a little bit. <laughs> He decided he wasn't going to do that anymore. But the funniest thing that happened, well, two funny things. We were by the mess hall, and they used to put the pies out. It's cool, you know, and cook. We come by there one day, and 
I don't know who in the world got those pies. I was part of it. I didn't take one, but I mean, once they gave it to me, so we came by and there was 20 some pies and they were all disappeared, you know. Because we were marching along to eat all the pies. Of course, like the pie tins. <coughs> we knew there'd be an instruction, uh, inspection, so we tuck all the pie tins under the mud and so forth. They all rough. They never did find them. <laughs> so we got away with that. And then one day, somebody threw a bar of soap in the soup. That was terrible. That was the worst case of diarrhea you ever saw in your life. That was awful. And of course, in the, the washroom, there was only just so many stalls, you know. Oh, it was awful. It, uh, that, was, that wasn't funny at all. But when we got out of there, after eight weeks, I made the vow. I said, this is such rough duty and so forth. I, I never got any hardly enough sleep. I was always tired. And uh, it was really rough. We know it was rough. Of course, they made it rough. They wanted to teach us. It was good. And I vowed that I'd never go back in there again. And when they closed those doors and back me, the funny thing of it is, what was it, 40 years or something later when I worked for the telephone company, I had to go back out and make an inspection of the telephone system, the booze, you know, the public booze. I thought, I was kidding. I used to tell them, don't you share shut those doors because I leave those open, I want them back out. <laughs> So but, were there a lot of recruits at, at that time? Were oh, there a lot of people who joined up right jammed. after? It was jammed. There was hundreds, thousands of us came in. They and were then, building married all over the United States, all over the world. Yeah, Great the Lakes draws from a lot of different... All over the, all over the United States. It was, it was very interesting. It was good. They, they did a good job. Did and you meet uh, a lot of people that you wouldn't have otherwise met, do you think? Oh, sure. You, 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 know, you kind of buddied up. You had to with the, for protection. And uh, for comfort to help each other out it was a buddy system because you then never made it by yourself tying up those hammocks. One other last thing, and then I'll move on to something else. But when they, go on as long as you like. <laughs> when it came time for our pay, now when I signed up, it was twenty-one dollars a month. That's what we got. They lined us all up. It was going to be payday, and I thought, wow, because they did have a canteen on certain with the boy. I'm going to go and get a big soda and so forth. He marched us around and, got, and he gave us to us in cash. So we went by the first table where the officers and, and petty officers were. That would be five dollars. That's for this part uh, for your your pants and jacket. Oh, wait a minute! I thought I was getting this for five dollars. Time we got through all the way around, I think I had six dollars left. I thought, my God, I made more in this mowing lawns back in Montague, you know that, but. Uh, Fortunately, at that time, my stepdad felt bad, and he sent me some money, so I had a few, few dollars. But when we graduated from there, then they sent me, well, they took all kinds of tests, you know, for aptitudes and stuff. Some did you take are, them? I'm always curious about this. Did you take, when you took tests, did you take them in a room with a lot of other people? Or oh, yeah. Room? It was like a classroom. Mm -hmm. They had absolute, by the way, they did have tremendous entertainment up there yeah. constantly. Not every night, of course, but at least on the weekend. Oh yeah, they bring the big bands that were popular at that time, and we used to see the stars, and they'd come in and entertain, entertain us. It was, uh, the, 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 the entertainment was great, and they did take good, good, good care of us. And uh, even from the standpoint of guys got sick, fortunately I didn't get sick, but the treatment was great. But then they transferred to the University of Chicago, which the Navy had built it. They'd taken over Sunny Gym and Bartlett Gym, and then some of the classrooms, and then the cafeteria uh, for my training. I say that training, to be a signal, was very, very good, very excellent. We, now, we, we learned the flags, the colors of the flags, what they represented, and that sort of thing. We practiced semaphore, had to learn you know, the wigwag and the semaphore blinker lights, because they had it set up like in the gym, like a ship, you know, like the mast, and then they would flash the lights, and then we would uh, practice on that, as well as doing homework to learn. You had to do a lot of studies. And spelling, spelling was very important, because if we're going to communicate back and forth, we had to have the, have the spelling. Yeah. And uh, several other courses that were, I felt, were very good, and the food was excellent. We ate in cafeterias, 
and uh, it was, they treated us just like Princess said. It was really great, and uh, I enjoyed that part. I stayed at uh, Sunny Gym for quite a while. I don't remember just exactly how long it was. It was three, four months that we were there. Wow. And uh, of course, we had a lot of fun because once we learned to sing, we'd go down to Chicago or wherever we'd go. We'd always sing it for back and forth once in a while. And, uh, Do you still know it? Yeah, although Semaphore got to be a problem, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but that's when you're out on convoy duty, you're out at sea, it's lights and flags, but Semaphore, you're so far away, you couldn't see each other. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep practicing at it, because unless it comes second nature to you if you keep practicing, but we'd be out there like, at times I'd be out there for over eight or nine months and never have anybody, never use it. And uh, there's one objection I have to the Navy, and Navy, I hope you hear this. They never gave me a Navy manual when I was at sea, never gave me anything to study on. The only way I learned my own mathematics and so forth that I had was they, they used to have kind of a partial library on some of the ships I was on. Some of the books were probably printed in the 1800s or something, but mm -hmm. that was the only thing. We, they never gave me a manual that I could study or practice and uh, keep keep up with things. Fortunately, I got to be pretty good on the blinker and the flags and stuff that was second nature to me. But the course was the course was great. I really, really liked what, liked that place. And every once, well, three, four years ago, I got to go back and I remember walking up and down all the streets. And we were there at Bartlett Gym. That was why, where the uh, scientists were that were developing the Avon, mm -hmm. but we didn't know that. They were way down the other end, and of course that was off limits to where, where we were. And uh, of course we weren't going back and forth to classrooms, we just slept there and so forth. But uh, it was uh, interesting to find that out after the war, that, that's where all that was going on. Did, when you took tests, um did they assign you to be a signalman, or did they yeah. give you any options, or you just... No, they just... <laughs> you just, just get to assigned, be this? Yeah, you're a signalman. And uh, some of the guys that took the test at that time in Great Lakes uh, were assigned over as radiomen. Now, the radiomen, uh, the radiomen did not go in the same unit that we went to at, at University of Chicago. We were all, all strictly signalmen. That's interesting. But the radio, uh, listening code by sound, you had to have just like us, it was funny, the radiomen who knew the code, most of them couldn't read blinker. But I could read blinker, but I couldn't read radio fast enough. If they went slow, I was all right, but uh, it was, I wasn't accustomed to that, to hearing that. So they, so they assigned us, they, they did a pretty good job of what our abilities were. And uh, so we all got on the train, then to be shipped out to the west coast. and. Uh, that was extremely interesting because I had never traveled out that, never been out that way before. But the train that we were on at this time was like one of those Pullman sleeper cars. And uh, at that point in time, that's when these horrors and so forth, they were great. They were the nicest guys. They really were like our big brothers taking care of us, you know, it was wonderful. I remembered that. And if we had money, we would have tipped them or something. But it was very interesting because they'd have like a senior petty officer in charge of the group. And I remember driving, when we went, it was a northern route, we were going up through Montana and out that way, and we had no idea where we were going. But after about two days on that night, because we didn't go straight through, they kept putting us on side guard and sidelines and somehow or other, I don't know whether that was secrecy or priority or what. But I remember the second so you could night. See the scenery. Oh, the scenery. Mm -hmm. And I remember going through Dakota, because down in Tecumseh, where in down southern Michigan, I used to do a lot of pheasant hunting. Oh my God, they had pheasants sitting all over the fences and everything else down there. Oh, God. Okay. So I remember this one night, I don't know why, I went up to the back end of the train. In those days, the back end of the train was like a club car, mm -hmm. which they didn't have for us, but. They had a little platform on the back. That's where the politicians used to come out and make their speeches. 
I was on, it was late at night, probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I wasn't sleeping. And I'll never forget the feeling that I had because we were way out in the desert somewhere, some wilderness. And the moon was out, it was just a little hazy. And there wasn't a thing, just the railroad tracks, and that was all. There was no buildings, no shacks, no nothing. And as we traveled along, I thought, oh my God. This thing is right out in the middle of nowhere, you know? And it got the strangest feeling. I thought, I have no idea where I'm going to go. But this is a real transition, a real change in my life of what's, what's going to transpire. So we got to California. That's where we went to Los Angeles. We didn't know we were going to be there. That was interesting. We were out there about six to eight weeks. Wow. For continued training. Well, they pulled us up and uh, waiting to be assigned. Now, some of the guys did go down to San Diego and then some of the fleet. That's where we thought we were going to go. And, uh, but it turned out that <coughs> we didn't. They were going to ship us back to New York. We didn't know that until they put us on the train. But <coughs> they, uh, they treated us real nice there. These movie stars would come in all the time. They had entertainment. We had Andrew Sisters and all that stuff. Well, it, was, it was really nice. In fact, there was a couple of stars that were in our group that uh, they, they were there. It was quite a very interesting. That one story I tell in there about the time we got up uh, Liberty to go ashore, we didn't want to do it ourselves. We had about three, four dollars, I guess, so we bought a bottle of wine. And there were three of us, and this one guy he kept drinking the thing, and of course, I, I didn't care for that, but it was so funny because we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We saw a show, we walked around, we didn't know what to do, trying to find a USO. And as we were walking down the street, he's, he's really half drunk, you know, it's terrible. We were walking down the street, and we didn't know anything about Amy McPherson. She's one of these evangelists. And we went down the street, and there was a big balcony up there. All of a sudden, the floodlights come on, and here's all these people in white robes. And, the, and my God, he thought, oh, my God, the Lord, the Lord, come down to get me. And it was terrible. So it was funny, because as we're standing there, I figured, I, I knew better than that. I knew that this, this had to be something going on, a church of some kind. Somebody stepped out of the doorway and invited us in. Come on in for coffee and cake. Well, we'd eaten anything. We had nothing else. To do. <laughs> so we went in there, and I remember they had us out on that balcony, and the palm trees were around, and these people were all singing and everything. <laughs> and he's standing there, and he had this bottle, a big bottle of booze up on it, and it kept slipping out, and I kept thinking, oh my God. So I reached over when people weren't looking. I got it out and I stuck it and poured it in the palm tree over there. I often wonder what they thought. So we decided, so whoever it was, some nice gentleman said, I'll take you guys back to the base if you're ready. We still had another day. We figured, ah, we had enough of this. So we went back to the base. But that was a riot. <laughs> it was really funny. But uh, then they had out that the zoot suit problem. I never ran into any of that. Because I, I just never got down into those areas. But. Uh, we used to go up on Sunset Boulevard, and uh, people, they saw you in uniform, they'd bite you in to go to a, a movie or whatever else, and USOs, and that's why we spent our life. But some of the guys apparently got down into the city and things, and they would have, the gals would encourage these guys to follow them somewhere, and then the zoot would come out and beat them up, you know. And it got to be pretty bad. Why? Uh, race riot, so I don't know what was going on. It was bad. It was bad. It was really bad. So they don't talk too much about that, but I left and I was going back to New York, but about a week later I got a letter from, and of course we knew about it, we'd heard about it on the, they didn't have TV, but we heard about it in the newspapers. The guy was there, he wrote me a letter, he said, in fact it turned out that all the sailors that were there at that naval armory and the officers had reserved every cab that they could get a hold of. And they went down into L.A. They knew where these zoot suiters were congregating. And there was the biggest brawl that you ever saw. And uh, so that took care of that. They didn't bother the sailors anymore. They left us alone. When I got back to New York... Now, how come they sent you back to New York again just to go 
I said, how come? You <laughs> Why know, not? They just got out of, out over here, you know. So you can they go said, to Wyoming again. <laughs> yeah. So they decided, now they said we need, there's a shortage of signalmen. Signalmen, the rate of signalmen was in demand at that time. They had lots of gunners and all that kind of stuff, but they didn't have, have signalmen that were trained. So this train we went back on was not as plus as the other one. It was an old coal train, and we were right in back of the coal car. And this took about three, four days. And we went down through Arizona. Oh, God, it was hot. And we were a, we were a mess. You couldn't take a bath. There were no showers. All we had was sinks. So when we got to New York, we went into the Naval Army, and I'll never forget they inspected you the minute you got off the train. And I remember we had a woman doctor there. Was with others, but she was saying, "Oh my God, you guys are a bunch of dirty slobs! Don't you ever take a bath?" <laughs> we just got off this train back of the coal car. I mean, man, we, we were, it was filthy. In fact, we didn't even bother to try to change our clothes because you got to wash your clothes yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when we were there, then that's the pool. Then we found out that we were signed to the Naval Armed Guard. I didn't know what that meant. Did it mean you go stand guard in some armory or something? I thought, all this training for that? No, we were the naval on the armed guard part of convoy duty going over to Europe or wherever else. And uh, at that point in time, this was extremely important because the merchant marine, the people have no idea at this point in time, America was in deep trouble. Britain could have lost that war. It was close. It was very, very bad. The German submarines were out there and they were so efficient, efficient. and there were so many of them. The books up there tell them the numbers are fantastic. You couldn't believe the numbers of submarines that they had. Plus they had surface vessels too. You know. And uh, But the England was being starved to death. They couldn't get the gasoline to run their planes. You know, after all, everything they got is being shipped in. They couldn't even feed themselves, you know, there's not enough land over there. So we found out that we were going to be assigned to uh, those kind of duties. I thought we were going to be on a destroyer and so forth guarding the fleet. Turned out, no, we were on assigned to these merchant ships as Navy. And we had our own officers. We had our own uh, room that we would eat in. We were separate from the merchant marine, although we got to be friends with them all. So did you get to, you got to do the pretty much the same thing that the Merchant Marine was doing, or were your duties different? Well, I was a signalman. No Merchant Marine were signalman, except the first ship I was on, the Merchant Marine had a, a radio man. The radio men were considered like a, a ensign or was in a junior grade in a radio man. Later on in the war, when I got, I was, they didn't have Navy radio men, but later when I was in the Pacific, we had a Navy radio man. He was a third class petty officer, the same as me, and the other guy was an officer, he was the officer smith. He's the guy that got the eight grand while we got, you know, we got chicken feed, you know, for the time we were out there. But when we, <clears throat> but when we first, next morning after we got assigned there, of course we were all still carrying our hammock, so wherever you went, you strung up your hammock, and of course they did have bunks there, but you had to put your hammock down on the bunk and your bag and all that stuff. Why? What would the good be of putting your hammock down on a bunk? I don't know. Navy had its own way of doing things. That was yours. They used to tell us that you had to tie that thing up tight because if you're around a ship and you didn't have enough life jackets that that would hold you up. It would be like a big uh, a big float to keep you floating. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> but uh, when I got assigned to a ship that was a pool that we were in, I had no idea what Naval Armed Guard was or anything. So they called my name off, and they were always, it was like a big lottery, you know. Pack up your bags, I packed up everything I got, and away we go. Put me on a little, uh, well, they call them delivery boats, you know, the little lifeboat uh, mm -mm, launches. Mm -hmm. Took me out into the harbor, and they took one guy and took him in on the ship, and took me, and finally, here was a, an old rust bucket sitting there. It was dirty. They said, well, Randall, this is yours. And I thought, oh my God. And there was a, what, there was the gangplank, you know, there were a ladder, Jacob's ladder. Well, it wasn't Jacob, it wasn't rope, but it was a regular ladder down. Pulled alongside and I went up, there was nobody there to meet you, except one of the gunners 
had been assigned on there uh, about three, four days before. He said, somebody told me to look for you, and this is what it was at night, you know. It was garbage cans, because I couldn't dump the garbage in the harbor. And they took me back, on the back part of the ship was, they had a forecastle that was down underneath the deck. They lifted up, you know, like one of these, uh, I don't know, I'll think of it in a minute. But they had a door there, and you had to walk down the ladder and go down. They had about they had about six bunks down there, and that was for the gunners and for me. And uh, it was terrible. It was down near the chain locker where they, they kept all the chains and all that type of stuff. And then I thought, gee, here it is at night. And they said, well, the captain wants to see you. So, okay, I go up on the deck where the captain up was the bridge. And uh, as it turned out, this was not Captain Kozlowski. He came on the next day. This was an older guy. And he was, so I just said, well, yes, Captain, what is it? And nobody's there to greet you. Now, I had never been on a ship before. And he said, well, we'll be shipping out at such and such at four in the morning, and uh, just be on duty, let you know. I said, oh, thanks, thank, thank you. Uh, will you have somebody call me because I'm kind of tired? <laughs> somebody call you, you get your blankety blank up here and such. And I thought, oh, my God. Yes, sir. You know, I thought, wow. What's this, this is terrible. I hadn't even suspected the equipment yet. So I did run out and I took a look. They did have a good flag bag, you know, where we keep all the flags and then got snaps on them. Because when you pull those flags up, you know, and then store them. But the halyards on there were made up, looked like clothesline rope, and which turned out to be a disaster several times because they'd break out in the cold and the wind. And, uh, but the signal light they had was a little dinky. It wasn't even a regular, uh, uh, signal lamp. What I have to tell you, though, that I was at the War Museum in Canada. The new, they have a brand new Canadian oh, War Museum. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely fascinating if you ever are in Ottawa, because it does talk about Canadians at war. Um, it starts starts with the with the Indian Wars and, and moves forward through time. I I, I went through a couple of days when I was on Niagara, but I didn't get to see any of that. Yeah. But they were fantastic. They they they, they really did a owner's job. Now, when you go out in convoy, you know, of course, there's the uh, senior officer present, which they would call the Commodore. He would be on one of the ships, one of the merchant ships or whatever. And then there would be uh, the escorts. These would be like the Corvettes. Once in a great while, you'd have an American destroyer, because our destroyers are all over the Pacific or somewhere else. And they would be maybe about five or six of them, but the Corvettes would Corv uh, the convoys would go out in blocks, and they would have rows across, like starting up from east to west, you know, there'd be like row one, row two, row three, and then coming down, then it would be O one, 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 so forth, so the ships were numbered, and of course we were given that information. Of course, I got that the next morning, you know, I knew where it was at, and that would be your number and your station. But in the signaling, the Corvettes would be all out here and the, the escort, you know, searching for uh, submarines or whatever up for protection. And we'd come along and sometimes the, 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 the convoy would come out in group. Well, that signals, majority of them would start from the senior officer present from the uh, Commodore. And he would signal this way for the ship that way and this way and back. Then it would be your job, wherever you were at in the plane, to either, if you were the first ship, pass it to the next ship, and also to those in back of you. Very, very important type of thing, because later on when we, when I was out going to Africa and those places, we would be signaling courses and directions and future locations and everything else to uh, Army transports. It'd be like 5,000 guys on those things. It would be very important. I was 17 years old passing that information. Well, I got 18 by that time. But I was like a, like a kid out there with that kind of information that uh, they were putting. Nobody else on that ship could read, read signals, just me. And uh, that's why, frankly, I told you I got frostbite in my feet because it was cold out there. I had no, no hard cold weather gear on my feet. It was ice and snow and sleet, and oh God, it was terrible. But that's the way the convoys would come. 
which is there was that for protection. But the submarines, of course, if they knew we were in the area, if they got down below, convoy would pass over and they'd sneak up at night. The worst time was in the morning or in the evening, right at dusk, where you couldn't see that you could, it didn't look like it was sky or water or what. But they used to travel more or less on the surface, but you couldn't hardly see them with the waves and everything else. And then, of course, if they came in close enough, they got ahead of you, they would drop down underneath, and then they would sight you with the periscope. But they would fire across. We call this coffee corner because they'd fire the torpedoes this way at that last ship there. Because if the torpedoes would go across, if it missed that ship, chances are it's going to hit something else by the time it went in. And it used to happen. In fact, I actually witnessed this. Because one time, one of our lookouts yelled, you know, torpedo, and fortunately, it went underneath back. We, we were going fast enough, sped up a little bit, and not to miss the torpedo, you could not run them, but I mean, our, our ship was going fast. It went underneath our fantail, which is the back part of the ship hanging out. You could see the torpedo. And this ship over there had signaled to me, and I had just signaled to him, turn off your lights, you idiot, you know, it's dark. Boom, up here, you know. They got it instead of us. Now this ship, William 10, was such an old rust bucket, they used to have fluorescent paint painted on certain spots on the deck, don't step here at night, because it's pretty rusty, you know, you could fall down in the tank. Of course, you were late enough, so it wouldn't matter oh, yeah. to you. <laughs> it was converted, it was a converted into a tanker, it didn't look like a tanker, that was one of the things that saved us, because tanker, uh, most of the crew quarters and everything was on the back end of the ship. And then there's a long space in between the bridge. But ours was like a, looked like a weird cargo vessel, but we still had tank. We were a tanker, carrying 110 octane gasoline is what mm -hmm. we were carrying. And, uh, but going down, the first trip was going down coastwise, down through this dangerous area. Went down into Galveston, Texas, that's where I got this. The big guys took me on. Yeah, what here. is your tattoo? Well, it's supposed to have been, it's all war faded. So it said USN. Supposed to be an anchor. Oh, I see the anchor. With an anchor rope. Mm -hmm. But, and Captain Kozlowski was a nice guy. I really liked him. And then we came back. Wait a second. When you were in Texas and you got this tattoo, how did you, why did you get a tattoo? Well, guys went out and said, hey, you got to get a tattoo. So you did? So we drank beer and everybody went out and get a tattoo. Come on. They used to call us flag. They call you by your race, but. Flag, you gotta get a tattoo. Okay, all right. So when the guy started, I, man, I thought I, I got infected. I thought he was my arm. But uh, I never got another one. That was the end of that. <laughs> one was enough. But we got I don't down think there. it would hurt right there. That's what I was wondering. Oh, I mean, that would be a bad place to have one. But we got down there okay, and uh, everything was fine. And But we came back on that ship. All we had at that time was two 50 caliber machine guns, one on the east, east side by the bridge. We didn't even have a gun tub. They were just, I don't know, you couldn't fire them. Huh? And one of them wouldn't shoot. They would shoot twice and then would hang up. They would, something was broken, the thing. They couldn't fix it. We had about eight gunners, but nobody, there was no guns in the, on the bow. There was an old five inch cannon on the stern that they had set in there. I, the date was stamped. It was actually uh, molded in 1850, 1889, 1888 or 89 or something. Couldn't shoot. It was well, good that it's useful. But it couldn't shoot. Didn't have the firing pin mechanism. So all it was was just for appearance. And the guys would practice, but nothing there. So, but when we came back, we went into Chesapeake Bay to go into Baltimore. And we didn't know, and nobody tells you until you get there, but they were going to put us in shipyards, they were going to refit us. And they did. They gave us, I got moved out of that crummy place downstairs. They built a, a place for the Navy, and another place up on the poop deck. They made a regular cabin and so forth. There was about maybe eight or nine of us in there and so forth. They still kept the guys in the back, because then we had six 20 millimeter machine guns with gun tubs. Those were powerful guns, and then we got the 5-inch 51, and they got the mechanism for that, and they had a 3-inch 75 on the front. But did they keep the cannon? That was the old cannon, yeah. the 5-inch 51, that was the cannon. And 
every time we'd shoot that thing, it would jar the ship so bad with those diesel engines that we'd crack the head, and we'd go dead in the water, you know. We almost got torpedoed one time because of that, which was another story off the coast of America that we were shooting at it. And uh, it was on the surface, and uh, it was way, way out there. I didn't really, I thought it was, I thought it was a guy in a fishing boat. And I remember the lieutenant that we had was up on the bridge and he says, hey, that's a submarine. I said, oh no, that's God. So I said, that's, that's a guy fishing boat out there, you know, it's right, right off New England. And like heck, so he got the big glass out and checked, he got the crew and they came out. So they fired at it. Well, uh, it was a submarine, all right, because we came pretty darn close to it, almost hit it, you know. It was way out there. And it went down, it just went down under the water. But we had broken down when they fired that thing and stopped the engines. And I thought, oh my God, because the concussion was so great. That was, of course, that was later on in, later on in the war. But when we got all those, that was when the war really started for me, when we went to the North Atlantic. Now, this was in uh, late January, early February. And on those books you read up there, I'll tell you that those were the worst convoys going out. It was terrible. The one convoy we were 1943, was that? 1940, 43. 43, 40, 43. You went through the year and then... Yeah. Was that Sorry, 40, yeah, that was, that had to be 43, the beginning of 43. And <clears throat> that was, there were 32 ships in that one convoy. Now, I don't know what happened to all of them, but it was terrible. We went out for the first six days, it was nice. We were going up the Gulf Stream, going up by... Uh, Nova Scotia and so forth. It was it was really nice. Then all of a sudden all hell broke loose. The weather just was unreal, you know, so cold. They used to have the uh, the merchant marine crew come out and try to break the ice off because the cables were all getting <coughs> the clotheslines I had. <coughs> they all got snapped off. I'd have to shinny up the mast up there to try to reset the thing because he couldn't lower the thrust. The, the crossbar because cross arm because it was all froze. Tried to thread that thing through so I could pull. pull. That was scary because I'd hang on one side and I'd see the ocean, the ship would roll and there's the ocean over there. And I, oh my God, how did I get in on this? But we were out there probably about 10, 12 days, and those ship convoys were slow, six, eight knots. That's about it. They could go no faster than the flow of ship unless you broke down. And that, all of a sudden, that first night, it just was hell. Because the submarines would throw these flares up. And uh, they, you, you know, like you see fireworks, mm -hmm. these golden twinkling things that come down, they would fire those things up and you'd stand out like a sore thumb, you know. We couldn't see them. They all, they all looked black, you know. Couldn't see a thing. And then you just sit there and wait and think, uh-oh. When's it going to come, you know? But it was so cold and so rough. When we got over into the Irish Sea, which we felt relatively safe because we were out of bomber range, and so we are coming down the Irish Channel, and there was mines in there, too, because we saw a mine and tried to fire at it. And we went up to, we are going to uh, Bristol, uh, Bristol first. And I, by the time we entered into the Irish Sea, now I don't know whether some of those ships appeared, went off, went to Iceland or what, but out of that 32 ships, I only counted 11 of us that got there. And I saw ships get, get blown up in back of us. And uh, that's scary. You see that ship get hit, and all of a sudden the siren goes off, and fires start, the ships start to turn. You see these poor guys out there thinking, oh my God, you know, because they used to give us life jackets and they had a little flashlight on them. I thought, well, what in the heck is that little, <laughs> you're out here in the wide ocean, that little dinky light, you know, I mean, what the heck? But I haven't think it was terrible. But uh, that was scary. That was funny, that, that one that got hit right right back of us. It was, it was am ammunition ship. It really got hit hard. I was in the bathroom, it was about 11 at night, and I wanted to go to the bathroom. And it was so cold in the water in the toilet, you used to break it out of there. You know. 
and I was breaking the water out, and all of a sudden, kaboom, I got that hit. So the concussion was so great, it knocked me over the other side. I thought it was us. I thought, oh my God, we're the ones that got hit, and I ran out, and I could see these guys running off that ship. It was terrible. But that was a tough, tough one. In the fact, they write that up, what up ahead it is. But that's why the Naval Armed Guard, they, they, there was supposed to be, I think, 145 or 165,000 of us. They had the highest casualty rate of any unit in the Navy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Captain, the captain we had was a 72-year-old guy, nice old fellow, it was funny. He used to like to go out and take his, he had a Luger. He used to like to shoot at those flares. <laughs> and he had Bull Durham cigarettes. And he would roll those right out there all the wind. I went, oh, no, I can do it like an old cowboy. I like those things up. I went, oh, my God. It was fantastic. We got over there. Of course, strange things happened. One of the guys that was on the ship, one of the Navy uh, gunners and so forth, he should have never been in the Navy. He was so offended and everything. He lost his mind. He jumped overboard. We had a terrible time trying to get him back. We finally got him back. But he uh, lost his mind. It was, it, was, uh, it was horrible. We got over to England. That was when I really realized that they were really in the war. That was a somber place. All their, you know, barrage balloons were up and everything. We went into Bristol, wouldn't you know, that first night there. And there was a, uh, a bomb shelter on, off the pier, off the side. So the ensign put me in charge watching the ship to make sure that nobody, you know, fired, because the guys get carried away and they want to start shooting at those bom the bombers up there so high, mm -hmm. you can't hit them, and all they would do is tell them. So I remember, he told me, anybody touches those, you got to shoot them. I said, well, yeah, big deal, you know. So I got the pistol, you know, and wouldn't you know, one of the merchant marine guys came up and was going to take the cover off, I don't want to get them. And he happened to be a nice guy, but I said, he was hysterical, I said, you touch that gun. I'm going to blow your friggin' head off. <laughs> oh, now, come on, Flag. We got to get them guys. I said, them guys are going to get us, you know. Finally, I talked him out of it. But I thought, but I really got him. I don't, I don't, so. But uh, anyway, it was funny, because when those bombs started falling around over there, of course, everybody started disappearing in a hurry. But you hear those wailing minis go on, you know, the sirens go on, so well, that's scary. But I have to tell you this, too. I'm not a hero, but out there in that landing at night, I felt raw fear. I really had fear. Thank God I was disciplined, because I did my job and I did it well. And that's the only thing that keeps you from going nuts. And I was so cold. The people used to give us, the women in uh, the country at that time, they knit sweaters, they were made out of wool. Well, you get up there, and all it was so wet and moist, the sweaters would drop down, they'd look like moo moos on you. <laughs> but at least I'd wear them, because it kept you warm. But that's when I got the frostbite. Oh, God, I, could, I used to take those sweaters and wrap my feet up, mm -hmm. but I couldn't walk. It, uh, it was terrible. But that was, that was a bad trip. And then we came back, and I went, then they got another captain on. Oh, what a, he was an old retired guy who was a Dutchman. He was the dirtiest, filthiest man I ever saw. A big guy, about six foot six. Big hulk of a guy. He was terrible. I remember in my story, he used to urinate off the bridge on the guys down below and think it's funny. And uh, he, was, he was just a junk. He wouldn't take a bath. He wouldn't use one of the old time sailors, you know, they have to save the water. Say, we got fresh water. You know, it's a modern ship, you know. Terrible. But, uh, and they used to like to, and he knew some of the other captains, and he might need to signal over to them. And he'd have a story written out off there, tell me a story, all kinds of cuss words and everything. I said, that is one thing that they will not allow me to do, Captain. I cannot use that kind of language. I'm telling you, I'm the captain. And he'd, you know, I'm sure I am a kid, 18 years old, chattering and shaking in my He's boat. a lot bigger than you, too. Yeah. <laughs> But even even my officer at that time, he sat and back him. He, yeah, you're right. You know, I say, tell him, don't tell me. <laughs> but I would signal anyway. But I wouldn't use the words that he was talking. He didn't know the difference anyway. But that second trip I went over there, 
that uh, we didn't get as much action as far as submarines are concerned. Uh, there was some, but uh, uh, that was that was a rough trip storm-wise because it was this would be on like like what about around April and then we get those hurricanes tail end of them coming in. So then I went back to New York and then we went to North Africa, you know, it was for the invasion. And uh, we got in on the tail end of the invasion because they always the tankers and all the other ships didn't keep us out of harm's way because you know those tankers well I tell you it was like a Roman candle you know it, those fires that burn that terrible. So we went into Casablanca. That was that was not a, except it was interesting. They wrote that trip up in the Reader's Digest. We had a fifth columnist somewhere in that big convoy, and there was an aircraft carrier, there were several troop ships. Somebody was sending out signals of our location. They were reading signals, and our destroyers were coming around to try to zero in on where they were coming. They never did find it. Sure enough, ships got hit, they got blown up. And uh, I went into where well, our ship broke down. That was interesting, too. Just, we were about two days, three days the other side of Bermuda. And when, when next morning, here was two other ships, the French ship, Lot, I think was the name of the tanker, another ship way over on the horizon of us, Captain Kozlowski, nice guy, he said, so shall we go back or what, what should we do? Because we knew the position that had the signal where the, where the convoy would be if we can get the ship going again. We were dead in the water. You know? So he broke out a bottle of scotch and he wrote me in the office. I felt like a big in the wheel into his office, big, big shot, 18 years old, poured out his job, darn near killed me. But the fellow like, said, shall we go on? What's your vote? And I said, well, I don't know. We know where we're supposed to go. Turn around and go back. I mean, we're not going to send us back anyway. So as it turned out, that ship, the French ship, no more and got over it, and then they broadcast it because they used to send out, they got torpedoed right over the horizon. We'd have been running right into that. Fortunately, we made the right choice. And uh, like going over to Africa, it was a dangerous thing. We were all up on the bridge, and we found the convoy. It was way off in the horizon, and it was so calm that day. Ordinarily, you don't see that water that calm. And the captain was up there, and the gunnery officer, and myself, and a couple of the other officers. And uh, all of a sudden, I said, holy mackerel, what's that right off the side? Here, a periscope came up out of the water. We couldn't even, it was so close, we couldn't get the guns down close enough to do that. Of course, it went down in a hurry, because it was funny. <laughs> I like to laugh about it. I said, came up there and looked at wow. <laughs> so it went down. So I signaled the destroyer was about it maybe three quarters of a mile or a mile away. So I signaled to him, of course, we shut off the flares. And he, could, of course, we got the ship going, and we were going the other way. And he unloaded his whole load of depth charges. I got the impression, because when they came back, that they had success. They sunk, sunk, or sunk the submarine. But that ship, the only other thing that was interesting on that was we had aviation gas, and we went in there. We unloaded everything, but they couldn't take it all. There was so much gas stored up there. So they put us back out on our way home, and they opened up the tanks, and we dumped hundreds of gallons of gasoline out of the ocean because you couldn't travel with a tank like that. And when I got back home, I got to leave. They wanted to give me five gallons, five gallons of gas because there was a ration. I thought, oh, my God. One thing happened, they had troop ships coming back from that time. They had Italian prisoners that they had captured. And one of the Italian prisoners right in front of us on the ship either got thrown off or jumped off, but he was floating. And I'm telling you, Kate, it was like you hear out to your parking lot, and the poor guy's out there in the middle of the ocean. So we threw him a life raft ring, you know, in the ring, but the rope wasn't long enough to reach him, and he crawled up on it. And I signaled another another uh, destroyer man in the water, you know. Now, whether they came over and got him or not, I don't know, but that would be a long way. It'd be hard to see somebody out there like that. What a what a horrible thing. So that was the end of my... And then they took me off that ship, put me on Sinclair Ropalee, 
That was a ship in 1941. It was a brand new ship. Even had a bathtub. Thing. It was going to be, they, were down, they, they had one stateroom for passengers, like steering. We used to laugh about that. When, who's going to who's going to get into the bathtub today? Yeah. But that was when we went to the Pacific. We went down to Aruba, through the canal, went down to Sydney, Australia. That was a long trip. The ship was fast. We didn't have, we didn't need escorts once we got out into the South Pacific because we were fast. That ship would go and travel. We'd travel 13 knots, maybe 15 or something. Why did it have such a fabulous name? Sinclair Oakley? Yeah. That's the company that owned the oh, ship. The company had a fabulous name. Yeah, Sinclair, Sinclair Gasoline. And uh, that was a, that was a first class ship. We had good guns. We had good signaling equipment. Finally, I had Nothing everything. Nothing dated 1888. No, everything I needed to signal with them. I didn't know how to operate. It was fabulous. And then the radio man, the guy that came to my wedding here in Chicago, was the officer. Nice guy, but he had a cabin with our off the radio shack, and there was two bunks in it and a day couch. So I got the day couch. They slept me in, and I even had a, 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 a what they call a corner come in there and uh, would make my bed for me in the morning. You had to make his, he'd make mine. He was a nice guy. And uh, the other radio room. And uh, that was a long trip. We went out there. Nothing much happened. We came back to Aruba, to Aruba. We went back again. This time we went up to uh, New Caledonia. What a, that was a staging area, you know. And that was the first time I really saw really Polynesian and uh, not Polynesian. Well, they were Polynesian, but I mean the Somalian type. It, not Somalian. Anyway, they were very dark skinned with bones in their nose and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. They were fascinated because they used to show movie pictures for us, you know, on the screen, you know, and they used to like to go watch that. But what a hell hole that thing was. It, mm -hmm. was just, it was just all kinds of servicemen, say, the Marines, everybody in there. So we set out an anchor there for about two or three days, and I got very upset at that time because it was so stinking hot, it was terrible. So they came on board, the Navy, they lined us up, took us over on another little uh, cutter out to another another ship, a service. We had to unload beer for the officers. They were having a big party, and we didn't even get a can of beer. We got nothing. Somebody and else they, told me that same story. And they brought, Could you believe it? <laughs> they, they, brought, they brought the nurses. You could hear them giggling and laughing, living up a storm and having their... And those poor guys, we were soaking wet with sweat and hauling that beer and all that stuff. We thought, holy Christ, that did more to break our morale or discourage us. Because the officers on my ship, even though they were merchant marine, and they, then they, this was when I had that real nice guy, Lieutenant Junior Grade, to help me with my education. He was disgusted. Everybody was disgusted that why they would do such a thing like that. Frank was in earshot. It wasn't only our ship, the other guys. It was terrible. So anyway, from there, we went up into the Ellis Islands group. We went up to the island, Fruity Fruity, they call it. It was a little, little tall. And uh, it had been occupied, and the Coast Guard was there. I didn't realize the Coast Guard was out that far, but they used to bring them in as the islands were occupied and they would patrol it. And they were on a little Coast Guard cutter. Those guys had been out there for maybe about a month, and they were getting squirrely sitting on it because there was nothing there, just, what, a dozen palm trees. And they all had captured little pigs, these little island pigs. And they each of them had the little pigs on leashes and stuff. God almighty. They were, they were, they were half nuts. And I thought, huh, thank God at least I'm on the ship. I, I can get away from this stuff. Then we went up north, but the destroyer escort took us because we were up in the battle area. And uh, they they went over to shell some of the islands where they still had some Japanese stragglers and stuff. But we went into, I think it was Majorial. I can't remember just which one of the atolls we went into. And uh, we no more got in there. 
for there was there was Navy fleet ships and everything. Cause this was at the time when the battle was going on over on one of the other islands near in that same atoll group. And uh, it must have been Jap because I heard a bunch of planes flying over, but they came so fast and we weren't on duty, you know, we were tankers and everything. But the ships on the other side of the atoll, the sky was black, you know, with bad aircraft and stuff. So whether they got anybody or not, I don't know. But the next day, we decided we were going to go over to one of the islands to pick coconuts. Of all the stupid things, and the captain let the this radio man, the officer, and myself, and four, four, we had this four oars, four places for all of them, and there was six of us in total. Little did we realize, we knew there was tide, but we forgot the time. <coughs> and we went so fast, we got away from that ship, it was like, you know, six or eight knots of current, and away you go. And I thought, oh my God, so we turned around, we're trying to come back, we could not row fast enough. And all we could see was out the breakwater out there. We thought, oh my God, if we get out in there, this thing will swamp, or we'll be out floating around the ocean. And uh, so finally, at, at my arms, my hands were raw, you know, from dust kind of raw. Fortunately, one of the Coast Guard sent over and saw us, and they sent over one of these power boats, and they came over. They didn't say a word, they just said, hook on. Apparently, other idiots had tried that. So he got back to his ship, and we had to take, and I'll never forget the captain, the captain we had. He said, well, Flag, I thought you, I didn't think you were that damn stupid. And I said, I guess not. I said, I learned, nobody told us what time the tide was out here, but that tide was fast. But that was about the only interesting thing that happened. Then we came, well, I came back to Aruba. We've been out now, we've been to Australia back, New Caledonia and back out there. I mean, that's why I mentioned the show, Mr. Robert. You get stir crazy out there. There's not that much to do, you know. So when we got through the canal, somebody was firing flared in back of us. They said there was a submarine on our tail. Well, we didn't see it. wouldn't mean that we'd have taken care of it, but we were pretty well equipped. But we went to Venezuela. They had a tour out there. And they, for the, for the oil, mm -hmm. and we were going to go in and take on a load of oil. Now, we were a combat, so we had to wear dungarees to go ashore. They, they would not allow anybody in uniform. But then on the end of the pier, they had a little cantina made out of this corrugated steel and stuff, and the dirt floor and so forth. So we were chickens running around. So we went in, thought, well, we get a beer or two. So we, we took the other, the other radio men from the officer and myself went in. And I'll never forget the guys were in there on the Merchant Marine. There was other ship in there too. And everybody's drunker and lord, you know, drinking banana rum and everything else. And a little guy comes in, he had a little Panama suit, barefoot. He said, Me constable, you know, me keep order here. I thought, I wouldn't tell that to one of these guys around here. And he did, and all of a sudden, bam, they sniffed. <laughs> they laid him, laid him right out. I mean, that was a so I told him, let's get out of here. I said, this is not a place for us. So I went back to the ship. And these guys, the merchant marine, they got so drunk that they come back to all carrying bags of liquor and stuff. Gunny sack full. Even the captain of the ship, I thought he was smarter than that. And I said, oh my God, to the, uh, to the officer, to my officer, what are we supposed to do? So the lieutenant came up, our gunnery officer, and said, I want you to take this, this gun they're having a riot down in the, in the emergency mess hall. Well, what am I supposed to do? Go down there and shoot all them guys? If I don't shoot them, they're going to shoot me. Ain't no way am I going to. I said, you take the gun. Now, they did like me because I was a signalman. I used to tell them a lot of stuff. So I went down and sure enough, they were all drunk as lords, singing and running, and getting in fights. One guy got hit in the head with a chair. The blood was running back and forth on the floor. Of the Another guy that was throwing them down over the engine room, right off the, you know, the stairways down the bridge. Oh, terrible. So that about dusk, we had to put on close up all the portholes for blackout. One of the merchant marine guys that was on deck was supposed to be in charge of that. He came, he was drunk himself, and he came up the ladder and he walked up, and the captain was standing there right by me, 
and the guy just got up just about where his head was up on the back level of it. And he kind of said, Captain, these guys want to listen to it. Captain kicked him right there and said, <coughs> down he went. I thought, this is a guy that's the captain of the ship, you know, the whole thing. I mean, oh my God. So there was a riot broke out. So we had to signal, break radio silence, call a room which is 50 miles away, and the Coast Guard came on board. And they patched up some of the guys. The guys got hit in the head with a chair. They had a big bandage on his head. So they sent us back to New York. So I went back to New York. That was on uh, June 4th. They gave me a leave. It takes me a day to get back to Tecumseh, Michigan on the train. Next morning I wake up and D-Day had started. I'd missed that. And I felt so bad. I really wanted to, I, I knew it was coming. Up. So I'll never forget, I thought, and they announced on the radio at that time, everybody go back to your ship. Well, I didn't hear that. No sense of me panicking. But I'll never forget, I went downtown, went into to get a beer, and a couple of old farmers were there. Don't you know you're supposed to be over there in France? What are you doing? One of these gold breakers and so forth? Is it? Yeah, that's it. I just got back. You know, I was out out at sea for about three years. You know, but anyway, I missed that. So when I came back, I decided that I wanted to get into something that something else. And the the the, the war in the Atlantic was pretty well over, and the Pacific, unless you got on a fleet ship. So I volunteered for amphibious. So I was in the amphibious training there in Lido Beach, New York. And uh, that was tough. That was hard training. I still was only about 130 pounds. They used to put you on those 22 mile hikes. That was that was good training. Marines trained us, you know. They'd throw you off bridges and into the water. And, you know, that was good, huh? Oh, that was good training. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. It was hard, except that I was totally exhausted. Of course, they used to kick, they used to have gas mask drills, and I could never get that thing on right. So they tell you, you know, you're supposed to just what what to do? I said, the heck with it. I go running down the street and then yelling at me. I said, heck with you. But uh, uh, then I got transferred. You know, we, we were going to go overseas. We were called Drew Damage Repair Enemy Water, and we had you know taught how to use our guns. Of course, I knew how to use guns. And <clears throat> so I buddied up with the guy. And it turned out he could have been. He was an assistant professor out in uh, UCLA. He could have been an officer, but he didn't. But uh, he and I got to be very good friends. But they put us on a troop ship. And, oh, I got to tell you, sir, we were on Lido Beach. So we used to have practice drills, you know, about landing. So we're all in these landing crafts and all that stuff. And this one time, they're going to make it realistic. So they had planes flying over us, you know, firing in the, over our heads, of course. And, of course, we had up in the enemy, it was the other our people were up there with blanks shooting at us. And we were supposed to come try to land. <laughs> forget. Because Lido Beach was where very wealthy people and they had their their, their uh, mammies and nurses, nursemaids and so forth. All of a sudden all the smoke was rolling in, planes flying over, we come in, the doors drop, we come charging out and I, <laughs> some black gal stand up, Oh my lord <laughs> She went screaming off. <laughs> it was it was a riot. It was funny. Poor uh, thing. Half the people in there thought they were screaming around. They thought sure they could turn oh, into her. No. And uh, it was it was funny. But anyway, I got back on. They shipped us over to England. This time we were part of the just the uh, uh, passengers of England. And I was no longer on, assigned to the bridge. But you didn't get a bathtub. They put us down in the, in the bottom of that hole and these bunks that were so close together, these canvas racks, you couldn't turn on your side that were that close. But you couldn't roll over. And I got the bottom bunk and the guys up and above, it was so hot, people were sweating and dripping down all of you. Oh, God, guys were throwing up. Oh, God, it was a mess. And I thought, oh, my God, if we ever get hit down here, I'd seen ships go and go kaboom, I go, we're dead. Don't even. They used to give us uh, practice, you know, to, to get out to get out of it. Forget it. Took 20 minutes. It would be long gone. You know? 
And we got over to England, and uh, of course we were pretty well trained by that time, you know, and so forth. So we were supposed to, that night, they was in some quad huts right off of uh, this little town of Fowey, just north of uh, Plymouth. And the boats were in, uh, out there in the harbor, and they said, uh, go back to the concert huts, we'll call you when, 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 when you're ready. We were supposed to invade. They were going to have us invade Brest. And I woke up the next morning, the sun was shining under the window, and I said, oh my God, I missed the whole thing. You know what's that? All the other guys were there too. I said, what happened? Come to find out, they called it off. They found out that we'd have been cannon fodder because we didn't have, all we had was light armory and stuff. Like that. So that turned out to be a fizzle. But anyway, I stayed in there. That's where I had that religious experience. This buddy of mine decided that he really wanted to become a Christian. He was atheist before that, but he was sunk in the Mediterranean and he'd been swimming around in there for about two or three days before they got him. And all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's no atheists in foxholes or none out in the ocean either, you know. So I went with him to training and uh, he went, it turned out that uh, he went over to a Jesuit who was a Catholic. Of course, I was proud of him. But all of a sudden, I, we, we'd get up at four in the morning and we'd go over and talk with this, this chaplain. We went over for oh, several weeks and it really made a lot of sense to me. And uh, so I, and the guys that were in my company, you know, all most of them were Catholic too. So I got baptized and uh, it was a very, very wonderful experience. And then they sent me up north of Scotland to Glasgow and ship's company and so forth. But then uh, they kept taking certain numbers, you know, they call them by pool and so forth to go over to France and everything to act as signalmen for crossing in the rivers and stuff. And I never got called. I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't find out because by this time I'd made second class payoffs. I thought that was the reason. They said, well, we need you. You've got sea experience. So they put me on a train and went back down to southern England to Hull. Hull was the closest to the French coast. So close that even in the early part of the wars they could still shell it, you know, from there. And of course it was bombed all the heck it was bombed the first night we were there. Then I got onto a ship and that's when the buzz bombs were still flying all over. Those are scary darn things, you know. You know, those you heard about the buzz oh, bombs. Tell me about them. Well, you know, those, they're, they're, they're not the rockets, but they were the beginning of the rockets. They're like jet airplanes, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would sound like a cheap motorcycle. And in the morning, when it's misty over there and you're out on the, in, in the North in the Channel out there in the Thames River, it's always foggy. You could hear them coming. They would sound like a motorcycle coming. As long as you could hear them, it was okay. But when they stopped, that's when the motor would shut off and they'd come down. So you'd watch for those. You couldn't shoot at them because you couldn't see them because it was all all foggy and everything. So we went through that. Then I got on a ship and this was a bad trip. I came back to New York and uh, the ensign that we had on there, the chair of the crew, was really screwed up. He was in bad shape. They took him off. They took us guys off. He was lousy. I was supposed to be the senior petty officer and he had his own buddy that he wanted to, that was bad news. So that's when they put me back on another ship. And that's when I went up and down, and then I went up and down the coast of west, west coast of South America. I made two trips down there, you know, down to, that was, there was no shooting going on at that time. Because the summer, the war was over with, uh, with Germany. But we used to go out. One of the interesting things, by, by the way, we went into Luna Ventura in Ecuador, Ecuador. And it was like a big, wide river, you know, and the ship went up there. And you talk about being primitive. Those people come out in dug boats and so forth. And they, had, wow. oh, and they had nothing. They would come in and they, yeah, they were gr so grateful to even get an empty ketchup bottle, anything they could get. You know. And, uh, <clears throat> So we went in there to take on fresh water and stuff like that. We made a couple of stops down, all the way down to Valparaiso, Chile, which is kind of a fancy place. One time when we went out, because see this tip, tip, typically was 
I mean, it was a liberty ship that we would haul cargo down as long as we're going down that way. They even put a fighting bull on there in the crates one time. They took us down to Panama and the Lima Peru, so I saw the bull. Bull fight, so I'm getting killed. I threw up. Yeah. I got so sick of that, I, I didn't understand that. But I made two trips down there, but the terrible thing had happened. The captain on that ship was an old, he used to wear an old railroad hat. He had no teeth. Now, the other officers were great, but this guy, why he ever got to be a captain to be on me, he was usually always roaring drunk. And I think of it as I had good equipment, good guns, good signaling, and every, everything that I needed. He came down to Panama, and when you go into Panama Canal from the Atlantic side, actually, you're going to go north, northwest, because that's the way, the way you're going up in the, and there's a current down there. Well, they always have a light ship out here about three, four miles out, another one about a mile out before you enter into the harbor. The harbors had submarine nets, and they always had two small uh, light ships, they would call them. They'd be like 100-foot launches and stuff to work, open the gates and stuff. And I got the signal to go to the light ship and then come in lying up on the lights where you could see the lights. So the captain was just, that was at night, and he, the wind was blowing, he was roaring drunk. I gave him that eh, blankety blank, you know, and then he was just really having swift fouls, he kept the fouls out. So he kept going, and I thought, and we had a hundred tons of dynamite caps in the front that we were going to, in, in the front hole, to take down some. Because we thought we were going on out in the Pacific, you know. And so then suddenly I got a real flash rapid signal from this other ship. Immediately, turn north. You know, you're drifting in. So I answered it. But I didn't have a recorder. You're supposed to have somebody record your messages. I never did have that. I never had that privilege. Because we were we winged it. We were all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. That was one of the objectives that I really had. The things that we were trained in the University of Chicago just didn't happen. No way. And sure enough, I gave that message to the captain, and he ignored it. And sure enough, we rammed into those light ships, almost on the rock. We had the harbor tied up, tied up for about 12 hours. Oh my God! And because uh, the cables was all over, you know, that was terrible. And uh, we, we blocked off Panama Canal there. So the Navy intelligence group and so forth took us all. And the captain printed out a letter right away, sobered up fast, you know. And he said, this is what's happened. And then he told me, because the guys on the bridge, remember, I'm the captain, my word, not yours. But I made up my mind. I said, I'm not going to lie. But I'm not going to tell the whole truth either unless they ask for it. So I thought, because they questioned me, why did you ask for a repeat on that signal? I passed it on, but I wanted it to repeat it because I wanted to yell it out again. Fortunately, his executive officer back me up. Because I thought, there goes my stripes and everything else. Do you know that even a year later, I got messages from Navy Intelligence and so forth, keep us informed of your address, we're still investigating. Not me, but this captain it turned out that he'd had other incidents mm -hmm. like that. Now why, of course, during the war, they took anybody. You know. But that's, that's the end of it. Then I, I got back to New York. They sent me out because at this time I was the patty officer in charge of taking recruits out to the West Coast. And Did uh, you so have a flush train again? Yeah, it wasn't bad at that time. So we went out, I went out there. But when I got out there, they said, you're supposed to be discharged. I didn't even have a bunk for me. They didn't even pay me. I said, what am I supposed to do? I used to have to go down to the Salvation Army. I could get meals if I got in cow line there on the base, but at night I had no place to stay. So I went down to the Salvation Army, they gave me, I slept in the flop house. That's where I, I got I got lights again, you know, terrible. And I came back to Chicago, back in the gun, and then he is a helper. So the 20 millimeters, you know, they, they lock in. They're pretty good sized guns. And when you clean them, you have to clean the barrels to keep them greased up. But you lock them in the horizontal, 
45 angle uh, position because the ship is rolling. So stupid red, you know, the <laughs> ship is all plump, the gun and that. <laughs> Not enough to get the captain. The guy that was, he was just not a sailor, but he was in charge. Turned around and said, where's my gun? <laughs> I'm up on the bridge. I, I said, you wouldn't believe it. It fell in the ocean. The barrel went right out with the springs and everything. <laughs> so we had to get, we had to get the authors involved. And Think of how confused that's going to make it. Some, some archaeologist, some, some, somebody studying the ocean in 200 years is going to go, why? <laughs> there was there was so many interesting interesting things that would happen. So many because we were totally undisciplined. We we had because the officers that they had, the gunnery officers that were in charge of the navy crew, they were all kids themselves, twenty three, twenty four years old. Probably got just ninety day wonders and so forth. Some of them were good, and they they did the best they could, but they just didn't know how to handle a group of guys, you know, you got about 12, 14 really rough, tough guys, you know, for, we're, we were on discipline. A lot of these people, too, had, that came from back woods, back hills, and so forth, that the fire is routine and everything. In fact, there were so many accidents with guns and so forth, shoot, we all had guns, sidearm. And uh, one guy almost bowed his knee off one time, just trying to shoot somebody else's shoes and <laughs> it was terrible. Oh, trying to shoot someone else's shoes. But one thing I want to say, really truly, that we were not, we did not go through what the guys did that were making those invasions and on those island ops, you know, and uh, that sort of. I realized how serious that was when I was in training, even though we were just practicing because Man, you're you're so vulnerable, and uh, so I'm not trying to take away from anything that the people in the in the actual in anything that they did do. Uh, everybody contributed what they thought should, they should contribute there. So they had an awful lot of courage, particularly like the army that was in Italy and going through all of that. The guys that invited on D-Day. Those who were in the Battle of the Bulge and stuff like that, I wouldn't t take a thing away from them. They deserve all the credit and honor and glory that they 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 des should deserve. But yet, all of us guys did the best that we could with what we had. It was an important thing. I that's the one criticism that I do have about any of the information and any of the things that they were telling about and then after the war about the things that turned the tide of the war. I think we had a big part of that in that convoy duty. And it was, you were sitting ducks, even though, sure, we had guns on, but unless the submarines came up, we couldn't shoot them. And there was a lot of people got lost. And once you got out there in that ocean, that ship went down. That, that's it. I mean, just forget it. You, if you got to a lifeboat, you'd freeze to death where you go and you couldn't stay in that water three minutes for you to be uh, totally frozen to death or, you know, out of commission. So it was a very difficult situation, but yet, yes, we, we, we served as best we could. And uh, so I appreciate that fact. I feel that it was such a surprise when I was in Amphibious. That was two years or so after I'd been in, and I was in that Amphibious in England. And one day I got a letter from my father that he was in the Navy out in, that's where I, he was in my father, uh, out in the, in Hawaiian Islands. And I thought, what in the heck are you doing in Pearl Harbor? He had volunteered. And the funny thing of it is I'd worked so hard to become a second class petty officer and they made him first <laughs> because he was, he, he was a pattern maker and he could do things and they put him into the shipyard out there when ships would come in that need pieces and so forth why well, yeah, he could do that and uh, I used to laugh about that he'd say well that's where it goes <laughs> but he stayed in he was in about a year year and a half two years but I never saw him but it was until the day he got discharged and he came home from Great Lakes I was home on a leave in between my ships 
and he got off the train there to Battle Creek, and I'll never forget. He got off, he got down, and he kissed the ground, and he had a bottle of booze, and it slipped out and it broke, <laughs> and he sat there trying, <laughs> trying to pick up the booze. <laughs> but, uh, so I give him, give him credit, yeah, he volunteered. To, Why to did he volunteer, do you think? I don't know, I just think that he, People were very patriotic in those days, plus the fact that my stepmother was a nurse, Percy Jones, in the government, for the government nurse. And she was, there was, see, my sister and brother, or my half-brother, said they were another part of my mother's family. Mm. And uh, I think he just felt that he wanted to go and serve, to do something. And he got very much involved in the American Legion after the war, and, which gave him status gave us some uh, station in there and, uh, and, but uh, it was a very very interesting time at that time it was entirely different than I think when yeah when the Korean War started it was a little different thing I was married by that time and had a child a friend of mine had, <coughs> that I, a buddy of mine part of my wife's family had signed up to go back, and they were offered me another stripe if I wanted to go back, and I thought, well, I'm a civilian now. But it's where you had to go back in and take a physical and so forth. I saw more guys coming in there that needed eye doctors and wearing glasses and walking on canes and everything else, but uh, fortunately I did not sign up. The next week that buddy of mine got called. He was in God. I would have been with God, and that would have changed my whole life. But by this time, I had gotten into the telephone company, and I enjoyed what I was doing. And uh, I did not appreciate, I was not really interested in Vietnam. By this time, I got a son myself. I thought that was a bad place to go. I didn't think that war was right, and that wasn't my call. I mean, it was the country's call, but there was so much subterfuge that took place on that thing. And full well, like President Eisenhower had always said, and General Eisenhower, that's the worst place in the world is to get caught in some down there in southeastern jungle down there. You just can't win. We're experiencing the same thing over there in Iraq today. I agree with the President. I think what he had is a very altruistic uh, point of view, you know, to give those people democracy. They don't want democracy. They're Al-Qaeda. And uh, it, it's a tough situation. Of course, we got to support that. And I do support him and what he's doing, but uh, that's a tough situation. We haven't heard the last chapter on this either. So when you came back, did you uh, did you go to work or did you go to school on the GI Bill? Oh, when I came back, I took uh, well my my stepdad. I went I, I went to work down in his shop because he was superintendent of that that other. Uh, a foundry and machine shop. So I took a, I took a job down there when I was waiting to go back to college. The only college I could get into that quick. I got out in November. I wanted to start school first of the year. It was Adrian College, which was 12 miles away. It's a ministerial school. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that I was interested in that, but uh, uh, so they would accept, they accept veterans, but it was a bad place to be as far as a veteran is concerned because the principal and the assistant principal had both been in jail because they had led people to resist the draft when they were in Elvin College mm -hmm. and they got fired from those jobs and this school was one of those bleeding heart type things. It was a ministerial type of school really from the, they were really evangelical to the extreme, you know. I had two strikes against me. Number one, I was a Catholic at the time, which a history teacher could, the professor couldn't stand. But everybody got a straight C because that way the government would pay. If you got anything less, they wouldn't pay. Okay, but they wouldn't give you anything anymore. Mm -hmm. When they used to address us in the assembly, they'd say, ladies and gentlemen, and you veterans. Well, anyway, so I decided that, I, I went through, I got my eight hours of English and uh, a couple of other courses. Thought I'd transfer over to Western Michigan, which is Kalamazoo, 
And somehow or other, my GI bill got all fouled up in that transfer. And when I went over there, I had to buy my own books. They didn't have that thing straightened out yet. And I had no subsistence for a place to live or anything else. And I used to hitchhike back and forth from Kalamazoo to Battle Creek, which is about, what, 25, 30 miles. Yeah. I didn't even have the 15 cents or the, the dime to ride the bus across Kalamazoo. I used to have to walk all the way across Kalamazoo to go to the place where I could hitchhike and stay at my grandmother's, which was on the, that side of Battle Creek. And it got pretty rough, so I took a job in the foundry working part-time, trying to make money. But after you worked eight hours in the foundry pouring hot weather, you weren't ready to, you know, for my study. So they came through the college at that time, and there were various industries and companies were advertising for people. And I read this ad for Woolworth manager training program so forth so I had enough credits that they said we'll continue down. Well that turned out to be nothing but a glorified stock boy is what it amounted to be. And that's where I met my wife. I came to Chicago, I had thirty six dollars in my pocket. Some of that raggedy clothes that I'd had in the bag, you know, still saved those. <laughs> and uh, so I got a job for twenty bucks a week. It cost me I think my room and board was twelve. Didn't give me an awful lot of money to go wooing a, wooing a girl, but she was a senior in high school. She was 19 at the time. She had been out one year. She had some disease or something. So she was working in the office part-time. And uh, she was pretty classy, you know, I thought, oh, God. So she used to work on what we called the money desk for people at that time couldn't cash anything more than a $20 bill. So they would have me at night, and I'd have to run around and get the money and bring it over to there. That's how we got acquainted. But she, she was really a, really a good-looking gal, and I, I just felt kind of humble and so forth. But she was so nice. And uh, so one time I did, I said, how about a cup of coffee? Of course, we had a counter in the, in, in, in the store. But I said, let's go across the street, so because they would always call on us to do things. So that was our first date out a cup of coffee. It was funny because I guess the God had something in charge from a uh, plan for me because he said, she said, I don't go with anybody that isn't Catholic. <coughs> it just happened. <laughs> the good Lord was looking over your children. And uh, so anyway, it was funny because her parents used to come down. They said it to look. I know they were checking me out. And uh, and that wonderful, wonderful family. They're all dead now. I miss them so much. But her brother was a policeman in Chicago. He was a sergeant. And uh, the whole family was just absolutely wonderful. And uh, so I went to work. Finally, the telephone company was a dead-end job. You know. or, I mean, the uh, Wolvers was a dead-end job. I finally got up to where I was making $70 a week. Of course, by this time, we had a baby. But my mother-in-law kept saying, you got to get into something else. I want you to go in the telephone company. And she said, it's pretty hard to get in there, but see what you can do. And I, I took the test, took a day off, and went down. And apparently I did all right, but they sent me a letter of acceptance, but I never bothered to open it. Just oh, like no. the of there. It was there for about three, four weeks. Finally, I got upset down at, at the lower, so, and uh, so, my wife opened it. She said, you know, you, you, you've been hired. You just, they'll take you. So I took the letter and went downtown. In those days, they used to have the nickel phones in people's houses. That's before your time. People either had great direct service or they had to pick them. And people would do that. They'd have to put a nickel in the phone in the house to make it work. Mm -hmm. Well, my job at that time was to go around and collect all those nickels and make bills. Because if there wasn't enough in the box, then they had to pay. Mm -hmm. Part of that was also to sell people to get rid of those nickel phones, take the other type of flat rate service. Right. So I, I did pretty good on that. So they promoted me, moved me up to what we call bag and tag. That was for the public telephones. And I would collect those. They'd give you a truck. And I had a, the west side of Chicago. We used to collect five to six thousand dollars a day. And, and I got held up robbed and the hijack. 
and uh, threatened and all that stuff. It was, it was a bad scene. But it turned out that I identified one of the guys, my brother-in-law being on the police force, helped, helped with it. And because I did went to court, got things settled, and made a good impression upon people in the phone company. So they made a service engineer out of me, which was double junk, you know. Wow. So I went to Evanston. Service engineer was where we would go out with people, a primary business, and we would analyze their communication needs, whether they need all the way from just a simple key button sets all the way up to huge uh, switchboards arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I got pretty good at it. My wife was pretty good too, because I used to have to do a lot of paperwork, fill out a lot of forms and diagrams. I taught her how to do it, so we'd sit at night and do all that stuff. So I got promoted again. I went up to Rockford to sell two-way radio. They didn't have radio telephone that would reach out that far. That was before all the modern stuff. So I just had two-way radio, like for police departments, ready mates. And I had the territory in the north part of Illinois. I did pretty good on that. I sold trucking companies and ready mix companies. And I even figured it out that uh, veterinarians are like doctors to run call. So I talked veterinarians into having little systems. So I got promoted. They moved me back to Chicago. And they made an instructor out of me. Then I ended up being district marketing manager out in Oak Park. Then I went downtown to headquarters staff. And that's where I became an editor and an author and all that stuff. I wrote the marketing handbook. And I had, uh, I had a staff that time of uh, about five or six people, all management people. Wow. Because I had to have people that had experience. And did you feel like that the stuff that you learned in the service helped you at all? Uh, I think it taught me discipline. It taught me to... Uh, to uh, well, it taught you how to be a good manager, too, you know, having seen oh, good yeah. managers. And yeah, because it did. Plus the fact, too, it taught me that uh, uh, to be independent, but yet to, to cooperate and rely and, 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 and don't try to be a one-man army yourself. And uh, it taught me respect for management even though some of them I didn't respect very well, but uh, it taught me that. Uh, it did taught me, teach me the value of discipline. I'm not talking about regimental type of thing, but honesty, dis de decency, and trustworthiness, which I think that's innate. I think that's in people. I, I think, but I think it enhanced a lot of it. But it, uh, it, it did a lot in that sense. It uh, taught me how to cooperate with people. That the even a lot of the people, so some of those guys that they brought on in, in that nag, those gunners and so they could, some of them couldn't read and write. It was terrible. It taught me how to work with people, get along with that sort of thing. <coughs> uh, I think the only real disappointment that I had was the fact that the country really was not made well aware of the contribution that we NAGs gave to this country. Now, the Merchant Marine here of the last 10 years or so, they've been getting a lot of publicity. You know, there's a lot of uh, documentaries and so forth, but none on NAG. There isn't any on my NAG. None of us got any. And some of the stuff we had to work with, we had to be self-reliant. When I went on board this old tub, by the way, I understand. I don't know whether it's true or not, but when I got off that ship, one guy stayed on, and they told me when I came back six months later on another ship that it got blown up the next time it went out. And there was only three guys got off it because it was a tanker. It went up in flames. And I would have been, I was going to sign over again. I was going to say, gee, leave me on. Good thing I didn't. Good Lord's watching out for me, I guess. But, uh, that that I that I feel very short changed on. We didn't even get a battle star, and we were in battle out there constantly. That was the Battle of the Atlantic. I can never I, I remember a couple times we came into New York, and there was a guy, a nice fellow I met in the USO, and we buddied up, you know. So, and here he had all kinds of battle stars. He was a cook. He was a cook on. Uh, uh, 
you know, on, a, on, a, on a battleship. And I said, what the heck? He said, never you were. The only thing you would hear, he'd be down, down in, in the bowels of the ship when they got going on. He never saw a gun. I got shot at in Casablanca, you know, when we were on, on board, because they, the Arabs in there and, and the Vichy French, you know, they were still hostile, even though we conquered the place. But they, they we wouldn't wear white uniforms at night. You'd stand out on the deck of the ship. Every once in a while, you hear ping, somebody take a shot at, I don't know whether it was the Arabs or who it was, but uh, and the, and having been out through all of that, we never even got one battle star, nothing. No recognition whatsoever. Only thing I got was the ribbons for Atlantic or American uh, area of operations. Mm -hmm. I thought it was thought it was a shame, particularly some of those guys that were right down in the uh, in the invasion of Crete. I thought that's where I was going when I was, after we left Casablanca. <clears throat> a lot of those guys, you know, really got mangled up down there. Like this buddy of mine, that's where he was floating around in the in, in the Mediterranean. <coughs> but it's uh, just none, none whatsoever. I think too, they could have done a better job of giving us more supervision. First of all, because it was an awkward situation, because the captain was in charge of the ship, but he wasn't had nothing to do with us, mm -hmm. and he felt kind of reluctant to take charge of any of us or to issue anything. Sure, it's his ship, you know, and anything that we would do that would affect the ship, yeah, he had response. But as far as military means, and like I said, all that time I was out there, never got a na uh, Navy manual, never got anything else. So when I made second class, I made it strictly on the ability that I had as a signal. A lot of things I didn't know the answers to it because I didn't have the books, I didn't have anything to study with. <coughs> I think that's a shame. I think a lot of people who go into the service, particularly today, people are volunteering, they're going into that, that those opportunities should be provided for them. I guess they do that today, but maybe they weren't. But we sure didn't get it. And how they would cut us loose. Like when we pulled into Chesapeake Bay that time, coming back from Africa, we were in Chesapeake Bay, and one of the boilers blew up on the ship. We thought we were, thought we were hit, you know. Of course, we were dead in the water. So what happened? They took the gunnery officer, which was our officer, the captain, some of the other officers off the ship. We sat there for two days. We didn't know where anybody was. And we're out there in the middle of the, you know, you can't jump off the ship. You're 10 miles from shore, you know. We sat there. And it ended up that one of the hillbilly Navy guys and one of the mercury got in a big knife fight. I don't know what all happened. There's blood all over the place. Somehow or other, somebody was able to get a hold of somebody to get them off the ship. But that kind of, that, that should never be. Same way I was talking about the guys having guns. The guy, first guns we had was 45s. They were automatic, you know. The guys were never trained on how to, how to handle those things. But they strap a 45 on you until you go stand gang fight gang. Well, this one guy, I was in my bunk down, that was when we were down, down below in that hoaxel. Guy was standing there by the, there was a bench alongside the side of the ship. And he's sitting there aiming at his, fooling around, aiming at his, his knee. First thing I know, kabow, we all woke up, of course, in that small room. We thought, oh my God, there's some torpedoes. I looked. He blew, fortunately, didn't, didn't hit his, it, all he did was break, break the skin, but his, his, ah. his uniform really was all tore up. The guy on the monk right there just put his new pair of shoes out there, and that bullet went through, <laughs> tore one of those shoes all to pieces. The other guy had just raised up on the next bed to go to the john, and the bullet left in his bed. Well, we should have got up and just beat the living heck out of the <laughs> guy, you know, but we didn't. And we reported nothing happened. Oh, oh, you know, you do you think you were old enough to, because you en enlisted when you were 17? Do you think that was, uh, do you think it wouldn't have made any difference? No, I, it depends on the background. Now, I was pretty self-reliant because of break up in my family and going back and forth. But uh, no, I, 
I think a lot of guys threw the draft at that time, you know. They always said if you could see lightning and hear thunder, why uh, you were in, you know. But I think the one that I felt sorry for was the guy that wanted to jump overboard or go in swimming when we were over in, in uh, Cardiff, Wales, in the harbor. And, the t and he went, went down off, he was down on the ladder, he was Jacob's ladder, and the current was so strong it swept him away. And uh, we couldn't couldn't lower a boat fast enough for him. We threw the rings out, but they was gone. I got in trouble. That was when the old captain we had at that time. And I ran up on the bridge. He had just painted painted the deck. I ran to him. <laughs> I'm blowing the ship whistle with the signal. And he comes up there. Oh, he's screaming and yelling at me. What are you doing? The guy fell out. Oh, he's drunk. He's drunk. He ought to fall off it. This is one of our guys. He treats you the same people your own way. This is ours. And that time, I have to say, my ensign backed me up. And uh, you had to be tough. But this guy, when he came back, they, so another boat picked him up. Brought him. He was he was wacko. He was hard. Took, we used to have to stand guard. We had a special photo for him, sick bay. Took four of us to hold him down. He was just violent. He still thought he was struggling in the water. And it was a good 24 hours or so. We had to switch off to hold him down. And uh, finally he came out of it a little bit, but they still had to have a stand guard on him because he just didn't go bananas. They brought a guy, they brought a, 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 a psychiatrist aboard, an Englishman, and they put him in a straight jacket. And I'll never forget the guy. He started to lose. He was, he was pretty coherent at the time, but he cried and he kept saying, they should have never done this to me. He couldn't even, he used to freeze up when he, when he was, he was a gunner. He'd shoot the gun, he, he, he would never stop pulling the trigger. The whole, the whole round, the whole magazine would go. And I used to say, you know, Ensign Stahl, this guy is not capable. You should not let him up there on that, on that gun. Of course, I'm a kid, I'm 18 years old, telling him, that's, that's of course, I used to speak up about that too, but uh, that was awful. But see, they bring those kind of, and, and, and red. They used to have a guy, it's in the funny papers, they called him red, or I forget the, forget the name of the, the comic strip now, but that was him. He was about that tall, he was built funny, you know. And he had red hair, he was like an orangutan. He had hair all over him. And he was, he's the guy that lost the gun off the flagship. But I thought, maybe I could do something with him. I needed somebody to help me practice my semaphore. So I tried to get him. He couldn't even hold the flag. He, you know, he, was, he, was, he was really, really bad, bad shape. Well, I, I, my bunk was up above his. So one night I'm in the washroom getting ready to take a shower. And I said, God, this cold weather gear that we got on, you know, this heavy underwear, and stuff, that fuzz was all over me, and I picked that fuzz was moving. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, you know, I got cooties or something. And it turned out the guy below him had cooties. I had cooties. It was like, a, like, a, like the Eisenhower Expressway going up to my bunk. It was terrible. And of course, Outside, when it was cold, it didn't bother you, but when I went into the wheelhouse, when the steam was going, oh my God, you go crazy, you know? <laughs> so what they had at that time, they used to have, like that, was sulfur and lard, and they would rub you down mm. all over with that stuff. Oh my. Time we got to England, that was the first trip to Bristol. Man, I was so glad I spent two hours in the jar. <laughs> but it's, now that kind of stuff I understand. That the, the way we won the war, really, truly, <clears throat> a lot of it had to do with small groups of people using their common sense. I mean, whether it was in the Army or the Marines or whatever else, these were the small groups that hung together and did that stuff. But, um, but most of those had some kind of discipline. We did not even respect our petty officers. On my first ship going up, a guy named Gene Robinson was a first-class Petty officer, boats and mate, which is a pretty high rate as far as next thing would be chief petty officer. <clears throat> he had been on the Arizona 
He's the guy that I wrote about. That he was there at Pearl Harbor. <coughs> he was in the crew that all got sunken down in the bottom. But he escaped because he was out drinking that night. And he got back late, so for punishment, they put him on a little lighter in the one of those little boat, boats in the harbor. Took him out on a buoy out there to chip the paint. And he sat out there in that paint when all that was going on. And then the ship went down. Now, he was a first class boatswain mate, which is a pretty, pretty high rate as far as enlisted personnel is concerned. And then our photo, we had some of these hillbillies in there. So he'd have practically challenged him to fight and everything else, doing dumb things. We had a guy come in there one time on one of the big shells, on the three inch shells, open it up, pour the gunpowder down, put it in the, the uh, uh, into the cigarette container of the case, lit it. Oh my God, it's going to burn the ship down, you know? The officer never did anything. And even though the boats of mate went up and said, this guy is be really cashiered right out of the service. That's stupid. The same guy, when we got over to England, had the 38, was supposed to be standing on guard, didn't have the 45. And we come walking down, three of us. There was myself, another guy, and a friend of mine, <coughs> down the gangway, you know, so it's still, still inside the gang, gangway. This guy comes out of the mess hall and he points that gun right straight at me and he says, I'm going to, he's drunk now, Lord. I'm going to shoot then and he pulls the trigger. But it didn't quite go off. He lifted it up, bang, it went off. I got gunpowder and everything. Well, it went up on the steel over it, came down, hit my buddy in the arm, knocked him flat, tore his uniform. I told the officer, hey, you can't have an idiot like that running around with a gun. You're going to kill somebody. You don't know who the enemy is, you know. Did nothing. Yeah, well, we can't. He was just a young guy, 23, 24 years old. He said, you're in charge. We're in port. You should ship him and take him. Take him. Oh, well, you know. <coughs> He's just a boy, country boy. He's done. So the other guy that damn near got killed, and I almost got killed, too. That's, that's unconscious. That, that kind of service. And of course, on a regular Navy ship, you wouldn't have that. They're so strict. Mm -hmm. There, they have places that you're supposed to be at certain times. You get off those places, you're in difficulty. So they really watch it. This guy, Robinson, first class, after that trip, that was the bad one when we were up. He went into submarine service and he got his training. We had a code system. We'd write back. Well, he was a good guy. I liked him. And finally, I got the message that he was going through the canal on his way to the Pacific on a submarine. This was about several months later. I wrote him again, again, and he came back uh, unable to deliver address not available. Never heard from him again. He went down. You know, finally met his destiny. But I think the message out of that was that for me, that here was a guy who was a first class petty officer. And the officers wouldn't, wouldn't pay any attention to him because we just didn't have the organization. <coughs> That's terrible. It, it was unconscionable. And thank God that it worked out. But the, there was a lot of, lot, of, lot of bad things that happened because of that. That's the complaint I got, plus the fact, no recognition that we still hung in there and did what we did and couldn't even get a battle star for it. And we were in battle out there for months. Every day that you went out of that harbor, they were out there to get you. Mm. And it, was going, it wasn't a pleasant cruise at all. That's my story. Thanks for letting me talk. Yeah, it was wonderful. I really want to thank you for doing it. It's great. I hope I'm not talking too much. You didn't, you didn't talk too much at all.